Welcome back to our Alteon Case of the Month series. Feel free to comment below and I'll attempt to address any questions or concerns. This case starts with a 62-year-old female presenting after noticing some discoloration of her left foot over the past 24 hours. While the patient was concerned about the foot, I was more concerned about the appearance of the entire leg. There was discoloration and enlargement when compared to the contralateral leg. Even with the impressive physical exam, she denied pain or paresthesias. Given the appearance of the extremity, we grabbed the bedside ultrasound machine to evaluate. This first image was obtained just below the level of the inguinal crease. If you have experience with lower extremity venous ultrasound, the anatomy should be quite obvious. If you are less familiar, here is a review. The common femoral vein is the central structure with large echogenic material identified within its lumen. The femoral artery is to the right of the vein, and the venous structure drained into the common fem at this level is the greater saphenous. Hopefully you have appreciated the large amount of echogenic material and the incompressibility of the common femoral vein, both which represent signs of deep venous thrombosis. While DVT was diagnosed based on the previous image, not all DVTs are created equal from a management perspective. In this image, a more detailed look is taken to evaluate the extent of the clot. The common fem is identified just proximal to the entrance of the greater saphenous, with echogenic clot identified above the level of the greater saphenous as well. Additionally, as we slide distally, we are looking for the bifurcation of the common femoral vein into the deep femoral vein and the femoral vein, sometimes referred to as the superficial femoral vein. This bifurcation is often more proximal than many people new to this study first realize. Imaging this bifurcation is important because clot tends to form areas of turbulent flow, which are often highest at branch points of the venous system. This image shows that proximal portion starting just superior to the junction with the greater sap. We were concerned because clot is identified proximal to this junction, which could mean extension into the external iliac from the common fem. The bifurcation of the artery and vein is better identified in this clip with anatomy depicted as well. I personally find this the most challenging view to obtain compared to visualization of the common fem or popliteal. The deep femoral vein tends to quickly dive deep, making it difficult to visualize and compress. Additionally, the bifurcation is not the easiest to identify and compress in some patients. In this patient, the echogenic clot can be identified in this clip, and while not captured, the femoral vein was not completely compressible. After the proximal leg was scanned, the next step for a point of care study is to evaluate the popliteal vein. With this clip recorded in the region of the popliteal fossa, the most important structure to initially identify is the popliteal artery. The popliteal vein lifts superficially to the artery and in this image is found to be non-compressible. The popliteal vein trifurcates distally and for added sensitivity, I always attempt to follow the popliteal vein into the trifurcation of the anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and peroneal veins given the branch point concept of turbulent flow. Given the extent of the clot along with the accompanying physical examination, the patient was started on anticoagulation as soon as we completed our point of care study. Vascular surgery was consulted given concern for proximal extension above the level of what we could visualize and the risk of developing a complication like phlegmasia. Vascular did evaluate at bedside and the patient was admitted for treatment. I like this case because it provided instant gratification of suspecting a diagnosis clinically and confirming it within five minutes of the patient's arrival. Additionally, it brings up multiple concepts that I feel need better clarification for the average provider who is utilizing or thinking about utilizing this skill in his or her practice. While I don't plan to provide a comprehensive review of everything related to DVT ultrasound, I think an understanding of point of care versus a comprehensive study is important, as well as a quick understanding of the limitations and some of the guidelines associated with this study. If you have experience with DVT ultrasound, the previous case was likely easy to follow. However, an understanding of venous anatomy is essential for being able to perform the exam effectively. The structures of the deep venous system, the lower extremity, are depicted here. While the greater saphenous vein is not considered a deep vein, I included it because it serves as a helpful landmark to let us know that we are starting our examination proximal enough. Here is an example of how I start most scans. I make sure I'm at the level where the greater saphenous joins the common fem. We can see the junction here and the subsequent compression applied by the operator to make the walls of the veins touch. The astute observer might realize that the diagram shows the left extremity while the ultron shows an example of the right extremity with the venous system being more medial. Now that we have seen normal anatomy and normal compression, I wanted to show an example of DVTs in this region. Here we once again visualize the junction with the greater saphenous vein and find the common femoral vein is not completely compressible secondary to the presence of clot. This example shows another DVT in the common fem, just distal to the junction of the greater saphenous. Again, the vein is not compressible and there is echogenic material within the lumen. Starting at the junction of the greater saphenous with the common fem, as I previously showed, I now gradually work my way down while compressing every few centimeters to where the common fem becomes the femoral vein and deep femoral vein. In this clip, we can see this transition as the operator slides the probe distally and then compresses at that junction to make sure there is compression at the branch point. 
here's another example showing that region just after the bifurcation with the compressibility of both the femoral vein and deep femoral vein. As I've mentioned, most clots form at areas of turbulent flow and why there's so much emphasis on branch points of the venous system. However, if you want to increase the sensitivity of the study, I advocate for following the femoral vein, compressing along the way until visualization is lost. After I lose visualization while following the femoral vein, I transition to the popliteal fossa. The first structure I look for is the popliteal artery because the vein sits on top or superficial to the artery. If you only look for the venous structures, I have seen learners compress superficial veins in this region and not actually visualize the popliteal vein. To hammer home a recurring theme, while compression of the popliteal vein is good, following that down into the branch points and compressing along the way with the transition to anterior tibial, posterior tibial and peroneal veins is better and will increase sensitivity. In this clip, you can see some of those branch points as the operator slides distally. Here's another clip above the level of the trifurcation showing the compressibility of the popliteal vein sitting superficial to the artery. And finally, an example showing a DVT in the popliteal vein with not only incompressibility, but also echogenic material within the lumen. Many of you who watch these cases ultimately want to know how to incorporate this knowledge into your own management. Hopefully I've been able to cover the basics as it relates to the exam. To discuss how we can incorporate these into clinical practice, we often look to guidelines published by various professional organizations. There are multiple publications from various groups as it relates to DVT ultrasound diagnosis, yet there doesn't appear to be a unifying consensus for the utilization of point-of-care ultrasound in patients being worked up for potential DVT. The American College of Emergency Physicians' last clinical policy covering this topic was published in 2003, with a discussion on ASAP now summarizing the CHESS guidelines in 2013. So what do these various guidelines have in common? I think there is consensus as it relates to utilizing pretest probability in the initial diagnostic workup including utilization of a D-dimer in those with at least low pretest probability and likely moderate pretest probability. Those with a high pretest suspicion should go straight to ultrasound. There appears to be less agreement as it relates to utilization of whole leg ultrasound, which examines the calf veins versus proximal ultrasound, yet more recent emphasis has been placed on whole leg evaluation. Yet there is still lack of clear guidance for who to anticoagulate with a calf vein DVT. Additionally, there is some variation in language about who requires follow-up for consideration of repeat proximal versus whole leg ultrasound. So if all that is not enough, there is also discussion concerning two versus three-point compression. If you are not aware of the difference, especially since I discussed my interpretation of three-point compression, two-point compression simply means looking at the common femoral and popliteal region, with three-point adding the femoral vein since this was the most common area in which DVTs were missed when utilizing the two-point method. I am personally a proponent of three-point compression since adding this area increases sensitivity and test performance. I am also a proponent of using the term region rather than point because we are really evaluating more than just one specific point. Evaluating the entire area adds 20 seconds in each location, yet in my opinion results in a more thorough examination. Regardless, it has been shown that emergency physicians can do this well with minimal training, with multiple studies showing sensitivities in the mid-90s. Discussing each algorithm is beyond the scope of this presentation. Yet based on personally reviewing all the evidence, the next few slides highlight my approach. As a disclaimer, this is my interpretation of the evidence and how I feel it can be applied to the ED population, where we often don't have access to comprehensive radiology performed studies 24 hours a day, and each patient decision is not made in isolation. Each patient encounter is unique and slight variation is not only expected, but encouraged to best take care of our patients. With that said, before incorporating any single person's opinion, I would recommend looking at some of the evidence for yourself. For my personal practice, I utilize clinical gestalt to determine pretests, yet I do feel Wells is an excellent tool to help augment this gestalt in determining pretest suspicion. In these cases, a dimer is an excellent test to rule out a DVT, and no farther workup is indicated below a discriminatory threshold. Yet, as a disclaimer, there are certain scenarios where I will perform a bedside ultrasound without a dimer, given the ability to rapidly disposition a patient in a matter of minutes. If a dimer is obtained and it's positive and ultrasound is required, the decision for a comprehensive radiology study versus my bedside study tends to be a patient-specific decision for me, which is based upon multiple factors, including yet not isolated to body habitus, explanation for symptomatology, and ability to obtain follow-up. I think it also depends if your radiology form studies are full leg or just proximal because I feel that we are just as good at performing proximal studies. Additionally, I feel the majority of my DVT rule-outs present non-business hours where the availability for a comprehensive scan is not universally present. Depending on the adequacy of my views and overall gestalt, my guidance for follow-up and consideration of repeat ultrasound in five to seven days is patient-specific. My management for moderate pretest patients is quite similar. However, I have a higher propensity to obtain comprehensive full-leg ultrasound in these patients to fully evaluate the calf veins if available. 
Additionally, I'm more definitive about the need to obtain a repeat ultrasound in five to seven days if the point of care proximal study is performed in order to evaluate for cafe and DVT extension into the proximal vessels. For moderate and high pretest patients, utilizing a rule in strategy can save time and resources. If I perform the study and a clot is identified, the workup is done and treatment can be initiated. In high pretest patients, if my examination is negative, I will obtain a comprehensive study if available. If not available and my study is negative, one of two strategies are employed either a dimer or consideration placed in the patient observation for a comprehensive study when the test is available versus a risk-benefit discussion of outpatient follow-up for the patient to obtain the study. Again, to reiterate a common theme, patient-specific factors determine management. Each case is unique. I like to engage the patient and utilize a joint decision model. I did not cover DVT management since this is an entirely different discussion. However, most simple DVTs can simply be discharged from the emergency department with anticoagulation. There is no need to obtain a formal study or farther workup, and outpatient follow-up is appropriate. If clot extends into the iliac, like the concern in our patient, these patients should be admitted given the risk for phlegmasia with lack of great collateral circulation. I have a low threshold to involve vascular or interventional radiology to help with management decisions in complex cases. False negatives can occur, and this is why I emphasize appreciation of anatomy so heavily. I find that most false negative studies I review are when superficial veins are identified as deep. If you are concerned that visualization is poor, I would subsequently order a comprehensive study in those patients. False positives can occur, and the reason for the examples provided of the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes have a classic hypocoagram with a hyperacoachylum and are blind ending. Additionally, color flow can usually be obtained given the vascular hilum. Superficial thrombophlebitis and Baker cyst can incorrectly be called a DVT as well, and a good appreciation of anatomy will make this less common. In summary, DVT point of care ultrasounds are incredibly easy to perform and results in a much faster disposition for your patients. Unlike comprehensive studies, it's available 24 hours a day since you're the one performing the study. Test performance in the hands of emergency physicians has been studied and consistently is in the mid 90s. I strongly encourage you to develop a good appreciation of venous anatomy because it makes a test much easier. And finally, an understanding of some of the guidelines will help you develop a strategy that works for you and your patients. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the case. Feel free to comment below.